There is no doubt that our perception of each other has been shaped by media. And what is good journalism? In an age of power politics and cultural diversity, do we have a universal standard to judge? With tons of questions about the responsibility of journalists and objectivity in news coverage, we are happy to be joined today by Harvey Zordin, former vice president of ABC TV network, and Xi Qingduo, current affairs commentator for China Radio International. And via telephone, we shall be talking to Takasato Watanabe, Professor Emeritus at Dorset University in Japan and Professor M.D. Nalapad at Manipur University in India. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. Gentlemen, we recently watched a long-awaited event, that is the uh, military parade to, to commemorate the 90th anniversary of the PLA Armed Forces. Yet, responses from home and abroad turned out to be very different. The domestic perception of our military build-up tends to be uh, shored up by the feeling of nationalism and being patriotic. However, when I talked to Australians and Americans, they were pouring scorns on the implications of our military build-up, saying this is a street dancing, this is just, uh, you know, your, your army was beaten by Vietnamese in 1979, and uh, you haven't fought a single fight since uh, the early 1980s, so nothing could prove your army is a formidable force to reckon with. So we have different perceptions about the image of the PLA. At the same time, if you watch our homegrown television programs, there are so many military shows, as if this is a, no wonder we are accused by some overseas observers of being militaristic. Uh, I'd like to have your thoughts, Kim Duo. Well, uh, let's just start with uh, too many military shows. I do have this uh, same feel. I think uh, we do have too many probably. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, I try to find that there's, uh, you know, a probably justifiable uh, psych psychology, let's say, or psyche, national psyche. You know, like a, about 100 years ago, we call so-called like 100 years of humiliation. China was weak at the end of Qing Dynasty, was bullied by Western powers. So Chinese people as a whole since then has been struggling to rebuild this nation into its glory past, like uh, Han Tang Dynasty. So, you know, one way to look at the country is, um, you know, uh, the country growing fast is like, how about the military? Is the military strong enough to protect the nation, sovereignty, and the national uh, territorial integrity? The, the Chinese people in, as a whole are very sensitive to that. Uh, so military shows somehow seems to be very interesting to show, like, uh, you know, it's, it's like competition. It's like a match in the sports ground. But Harvey, do you think we can look at ourselves uh, objectively or can we be viewed objectively by overseas observers who follow very closely the development of our economy and even the military build-up given the heavy sense of history and the shadow I of history in which we are wrestling with the idea whether we should rise and have a peaceful rise? It's a very philosophical question without an easy answer, but I think it presupposes a certain amount of knowledge, knowledge that most foreign people don't have. China for almost a thousand years was the leading country. For 200 years it was stepped on by various Western nations. We don't know much about that in the West. Without that knowledge, we, can't appre we cannot appreciate what's going on in terms of your uh, desire to be a strong nation again. And are you suggesting that you end up uh, with a bias, a misperception about the image of the PLA? For example, this is a very assertive, this is a being mil mil militaristic, and therefore very aggressive for uh, the neighboring economies, and then we're going to bully those. Let me cross Bellicose. over to let me cross over to Professor Watanabe. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I'm afraid uh, peoples in both Japan and China have devel developed a strong feeling towards each other, particularly about the military build-up. Your country is proactively pursuing reinterpretation of the pacifist constitution, particularly Article Nine, and. The Japanese uh, are watching out uh, nervously and trying to figure out what our strategic intent has been with the explosive growth of our military hardware. I'd like to have your first-hand account about your interpretations about the impact of our military build-up. Uh, military building up among nations, if it is balanced, it is okay to keep the peace. And in case of China, when we see exactly the past history, 
the China has been so many times invaded by uh, Japan and uh, by sometimes by other, you see, European countries. In that case, to build up the military, uh, you see, a certain degree of the strength is should be reasoned, and I admit it. But to talk with others at the same time for the peace world, it is very important too. So. Uh, Military building up by China should be permitted or should be you see, recognized peacefully. Uh, that's my idea. Thank you so much. Look, uh, here is a reasonable Japanese voice mm -hmm. about uh, why our military might should be used uh, in a reasonable way. Uh, for example, not to seek the use of a coercion or force in addressing territorial disputes. We are not discussing the issue of Diaoyu Island, but uh, here is a. But but uh, the the crucial message that we imply at the beginning of our discussion is the issue of a nationalism or patriotism, and that gives rise to a, a profound discussion, a long term discussion about the impartiality. Do we have a real, unconditional impartiality despite the code of conduct that has been used and employed by so many uh, uh, professional Western media players? But in our country, perhaps this is just the early stage uh, uh, for the uh, media practitioners uh, to notice the importance of uh, a handbook, a code of conduct, uh, given the very unique political institutions and the relationship between the media and the government in this country of China. Qin Duo, you've been working for the media, uh, state-run media, for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you look at uh, the issue of impartiality? Do we uh, always uh, face the uh, problem of uh, censorship? And how, how do you uh, think about you know, the issue of censorship? Well, I think you know, the Chinese media is part of China. You know, as a whole, China is very different from a Western country, let's say. Uh, you know, political system is different, which is based on your own unique culture and tradition. Like in China, the central government is uh, held accountable for everything. At the same time, they are very powerful. Basically, they are uh, taking care of like everything of this country, including media development. So in this sense, um, uh, it's very hard to judge, to say like which is good, which is bad you know we uh, it's a, a complete topic uh, remember like if say there's a liberalization of a media the media will be controlled by a conglomerate or by a specific uh, like about a particular businessman will that be impartial will that be uh, objective and uh, you know matter of fact and all is controlled by the government uh, for public good is that better I would say, yeah, probably that's better. Uh, at, at least we are working for the public goods, for the goods of the nation, for the goods of everybody. There's no question about the freedom of media, which is protected by the American Constitution, say, First Amendment. However, what do you think of uh, the issue of impartiality? Uh, have we been held hostage by, for example, the issue of patriotism, uh, commercialization, our personal bias? What do you think? There is no objectivity because everybody is different. We're not on the same page. And as you go to different societies, uh, the differences become bigger. Uh, you talked about the First Amendment. The First Amendment is a very American thing. It says that the government shall not make any rules that uh, abridge freedom of speech or impact the media. But there's nothing to stop private companies from doing that. But in my experience at ABC, um, for over 20 years. I was never aware of any interference by the government in any news story or even in any commercial. Advertisers come every day and talk about how um, a news story might have been unfair. And the management always backed up uh, our people by saying, if you believe you have the facts, then this is okay. I think it's two different regimes, two different systems. Given the dynamics and the momentum in the right-wing politics in Japan, let me go back to uh, Professor Watanabe for his comments on the, the role of the media in Japanese politics. Now, no one denies that the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is one of the longest serving Prime Ministers since the end of the Second World War. He pursues the rewriting of the pacifist constitution and that will that means he will work very hard with the RDP to dismiss uh, 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 controversies and, uh, and skepticism about what he wants uh, through uh, reforming the Japanese self-defense force. Now, Professor Watanabe, uh, in your personal experience, have you ever been asked to 
rewrite your article, do you have any uh, examples to illustrate the Japanese uh, intervention uh, with uh, the independence of the academics and scholars? Um, very often, the uh, important person of the ruling party says that uh, the freedom of expression is okay, but uh, it must be, you see, defending the uh, advantage of the society like that. But actually, it means that uh, there, there would not be any criticism against the uh, central government of Japan, uh, especially in case of the Abe administration. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Watanabe, for being with us. Now, eventually, what we discuss here uh, is related to, to the perception of China's image. Mm -hmm. Is China a threat? Is it a, a, a rogue state uh, ideologically because we are not trusted for the mere name of the ruling party? Um, so the public perception has been shaped by the US media. Uh, does it mean, uh, Harvey, that most of the time American readers and netizens as well as viewers would go back to the era of McCarthyism and uh, demonized uh, communism because uh, of the name of our ruling party. There still is a, a taint of that in Washington and throughout the country. And if you get away from the media centers of New York and the East Coast and Los Angeles and the interior of the United States, that is definitely stronger. We have to remember Senator McCarthy came from Wisconsin. And uh, this is a problem. I don't think most Americans, in spite of all the publicity around the Olympics and all the uh, PR that China has done, knows about this nation and that it's so different from what they think it is, that it's such an advanced country and that people enjoy many freedoms here. And so my wish is that more Chinese people and more Americans could get to know each other through TV, through social media, and uh, through interactions with each other. Yes, indeed, the widespread use of social media could be called the game changer or revolution in uh, reshaping public perception. The SARS event back in the year 2003 was described as a wake up call in many ways for politicians, policymakers, uh, as well as the Chinese media. On the first stage, of our reporting on SARS, uh, we were not allowed to give uh, sufficient coverage. The issue of transparency generated a lot of scathing criticism about the underperformance of uh, Chinese politicians. Looking back in your review, Qin Duo, how do you look at importance, the importance of uh, transparency and our response to uh, disastrous events? Because we are talking about uh, uh, you know, the issue of uh, white papers by governments at different levels to promote transparency. The general public are subject to the right of uh, being informed in time about uh, major events. Right? That's right. I think transparency, obviously, there's no debate. It's very important in terms of uh, holding the government uh, accountable. Mm -hmm. And also for the SARS event, I think you know, for the Chinese government, some particular uh, politician at the time, and also Chinese press, uh, there's a learning uh, curve uh, how to deal with, how to cover a disaster like SARS. Uh, at the very uh, beginning, you know, people were afraid of, like, if you report it publicly, people will get panic, the whole society will get panic. So they try to cover some of the development. But later on they say, oh, there's no, no use, or it's impossible to cover this uh, uh, crisis. Uh, so they will allow uh, the fully coverage of that story. And then I think Chinese government, Chinese media, we all learned from that a lesson. That is, if there's a crisis, if there's a problem like that, we cover it, we report it the first time, uh, as timely as possible, and then get everybody uh, prepared, get everybody uh, well informed and then to avoid panic at least. The new generation of uh, uh, Chinese, be they scholars, uh, uh, lawyers, uh, journalists, uh, uh, turn to the U.S. for inspirations about the freedom of the media. We've discussed uh, your first amendment. However, in the first Gulf War in 1991, uh, you practiced embedded journalism and that gives rise to the issue of uh, patriotism. Now, we, we all enjoy the glow of uh, being a, a patriotic, but when it comes to uh, timely coverage, 
in an objective way of the military operations in desert operation or uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. What do you think of uh, uh, the professionalism of the media? I think it's not only a question, Jan Ray, of patriotism, but a question of objectivity. Those people who were embedded found it very hard to be objective. First, because they were fed information and withheld other information. Also, they were in a very dangerous situation and they had to uh, be careful. And they also were responsible to their military masters in the sense that their safety and their livelihood and their lives depended on it. So I think it raised many ethical questions and I don't think that there's a, a perfect answer for that. I, I think it's an imperfect situation with a balance. The, the news reporters should be in those situations, but they should not necessarily be holden to one source of information. Mr. Donald Trump won presidency on the platform of a populism. Uh, there's no, no doubt about that. However, today we are confronted with uh, intensive uh, carpet bombing of the presidency by CNN, BBC, uh, not BBC, ABC, CBS, I mean all the major media players in the United States have been bashing their president each day around the clock. I mean, 724, this is just too much for, for us who follow uh, domestic politics of the United States. I mean, what's wrong with that? Um, I mean, because uh, as I said, so many liberals who were educated in the West, in China. I mean, th when they came back, they came back with the American dream. They came back with their admiration for the First Amendment. They came back uh, uh, from the United States and Europe with a s belief that uh, they are our examples. Mm -hmm. However, when we look at you know, the American media bashing their president, uh, it seems they have no interest well, in I giving <laughs> an objective and comprehensive uh, coverage about the image of their president. Well, I think there are probably many perspectives. Just one perspe perspective would be um, Donald Trump as a president. He's unique. Uh, he's different from other presidents, you know. And uh, I think, you know, the mainstream media or the establishment in Washington uh, is somehow is yet to fully accept him as a president. I'm and afraid the issue by the end of the day is whether the media has been controlled completely by elites who are an important part of the establishment. And uh, we all know that uh, one major reason for President Trump to win the campaign was that he rejected the establishment. He rejected the elites. And therefore, this is the, the counterproductive, I mean, th this is the undoing of, of uh, his current day politics. And therefore, we see the strong rebound from the media, from the establishment, right? It's clear that there's elites and that they control the media to some extent. But they have less control now with social media because um, with so we, now we have the problem of having an attention economy. There's so much information, we're drowning in information. How do you get somebody's attention and how do you make sure it's the right information? About Trump, I think two things. Number one, uh, he gets ratings. So people want to have high ratings, media wants to have high ratings so they can get more money by, from their advertisers and, and have a higher standard and, uh, and standing in the community. But number two as well, I think that they feel some sense of having failed. Failed in that everything we know about Trump today, his inability to make a consistent decision, his ability to lie, his short attention span, all those things, those were no common knowledge during the campaign. Yet the media treated him like a clown and not seriously. I think if they would have treated him seriously, he wouldn't be president today. So now I think they're bending over backwards to point out his flaws. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> so this is a, typically the American spirit in their crusade, I guess. Uh, the power and those in power. You are watching dialogue with uh, Xi Qingdu from CRI and uh, our, our current affairs commentator uh, Harvey Zodin, who used to be a very senior uh, journalist in the United States. Uh, we'll be back in a short while. Please stay with us. <music> Welcome back. Let me go to Professor Andy Nalapat. He's now in Beijing. Well, we, we should have brought him uh, to the studio for this discussion uh, on a very interesting topic. Hello. Professor Nalapad, welcome to Dialogue. Hi. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I've never been to India, but I've uh, followed uh, your domestic politics uh, with uh, great interest. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, reform of the currency and taxation system. Very interesting guy. Very uh, a guy with a, with, with a boldness and the an invasion. Uh, uh, sorry, and a vision. So, um, tell me. 
your understanding about the role of the media in shaping the course of development and in shaping the image of Prime Minister Modi. Is he a good guy in, in the eyes of the Indian media? And at the same time, my follow-up question is, of course, China. Given the current border tensions, uh, um, uh, it seems China has been demonized, and the other way around might be the, the same. So what do you think? Well, I'd like to say that the Indian media was uh, very hostile to to Mr. Modi when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, uh, apart from some uh, the media in his home state, there were very few media outlets in the rest of the country that were friendly to him. I mean, exactly as the American media was ex very hostile to President Trump, uh, uh, then uh, the Indian media were very, very hostile to Chief Minister Modi. And yet he became the, the Prime Minister, and he secured for his party an absolute majority. For the first time in 30 years, the Indian parliament has a single party majority. So I don't think the media has had a lot of influence on politics in India. And the second point is that we have a huge and diverse country. And we have a huge and diverse media. So they represent religious interests, social interests, political interests, agricultural interests. And each uh, of the media outlets, it's very clear what interests they represent. So each of them had their own specific audience, and they're essentially talking in silos uh, to themselves. They're not really talking to people who are outside their silos. So we have a large number of media silos talking essentially to the people who already agree with them, rather than trying to make other people you know, agree with them who do not agree with them as of, uh, as of now. Thank you so much, Professor Nalapat, for being with us. Welcome back. The middle class is growing in size in China and they are very demanding about the social justice and justice should be done when misconduct has been made by the government officials or uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the civil servants, so to speak. Do you think uh, this is increasingly a challenge for the Chinese authorities in the age of uh, digital technology, the use of uh, social media has uh, very much enhanced and empowered individuality. Um, the relationship between the government and the media uh, becomes uh, a topic that has caused a lot of controversies. China vows to, uh, well, vow may not be the correct word, but President Xi Jinping declared that we would protect the principle of uh, globalization and the free treatment in Davos. At home, the construction of soft power may further reinforce China's readiness to assume the leadership, but many overseas observers are pretty skeptical. What do you think are our own perception about the importance of having a strong middle class in the olive-shaped society? Well, I, I think uh, you know it is uh, like a consensus you know, from the Chinese government to the Chinese public uh, that we should build a stable society uh, with what you mentioned, uh, like uh, olive shaped uh, this society with an uh, expanding middle class, mm -hmm. because that's a theory. You have a large middle class in this country tends to be stable, so that's uh, I think the country is working on. And also remember, you know, because of the different political system, if you look at uh, uh, that's why probably like uh, a lot of uh, media coverage of China in the West mostly tend to be more negative when mm -hmm. it comes to political system. But if you look at the Pew research about the approval rating of the government, since 2010, the Chinese government basically approval rating is about 80 percent, 80 and above percent of approval from this uh, public. But if you look at the government in other countries, it would be like 30 percent, 40 percent. So that says something probably. It's like a mystery. We have to go deeper to find out because that's in the Chinese gene, the Chinese gene of culture. We tend to be more uh, about uh, collective goods. Uh, for that, we stress very much about uh, the, uh, um, the, this uh, collectiveness over there. But if you look at the U.S., it's individualism and free market. So individualism basically means you care about yourself and you, you are independent of everyone. But in China, they tend to say like we have to, that's why you have a strong government, a strong central government. Mm -hmm. But that's also the, the tradition. Lee Yu, late founding father of Singapore, said most of the Chinese are feel very comfortable with having a strong central government. He is able to understand the, uh, uh, some aspects of oriental cultures. Having said this, um, we drew a lot of scathing criticism and the fire from the West for setting up uh, firewalls. Uh, we cited the importance of uh, cyber sovereignty 
uh, as an excuse uh, to limit the freedom of uh, uh, media. Uh, well, you know, China says, uh, look, this is an age of uh, cultural diversity, as I said in the leading. So you cannot use one universal standard in your judgment about uh, how we manage the relationship between the media and the government. Uh, I know Americans would hold a very different uh, point of view. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, contrary to our values, but uh, each country has its own tradition, and your tradition is uh, several thousand years older than, than ours, and it's not our job to question yours. We, we might debate about which is uh, better, and we have our own uh, perspective. But I do think in both of our countries that uh, the Internet and uh, the new technology is a complete game changer. And in China, I see it as a double-edged sword. On the one hand, um, it is easier for people to uh, criticize the government and to raise concerns that the government might not want to have raised. On the other hand, it's a completely open uh, source of information. So unlike before, where it was hard to get information on what people felt, you can feel the pulse of virtually every Chinese person on the internet. And I think that's very important uh, to govern, that people have right, the right information to make important decisions for their constituents. By the end of our very interesting discussion about the role of the media and freedom of the media in the age of globalization, let me go back to what uh, Ronald Reagan uh, said for the winning the second term of his presidency. He only asked one question, are you better off? Well, I wonder if he would say uh, in, other, in another country, the president-elect or the president hopeful would ask, uh, do you have more freedom of the media? Uh, which question would be more important in winning with uh, mind and heart of the electorate? I don't know. Frankly speaking, I, I don't have the answer. However, uh, on, uh, for this stage of social and economic development, I believe most of the Chinese would care most about well-being, economic well-being, and uh, being better off. You know. With that, we come to the end of an open discussion about a very important issue, the media, in the second uh, decade of the 21st century. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.